acellular pathogens. So the most common acellular pathogen are viruses. We say acellular because they're really not made of cells, right? A virus is a genome inside a protein shell. There's no cell there. It has to infect cells for it to replicate. So a little bit about the history of viruses. Um, in the late 1800s, three different scientists discovered viruses at the same time, separately, um, or in the same relative time frame, um, because there wasn't as good of communication between the scientific world across the globe as there is now. Um, none of these scientists kind of knew the other one had discovered viruses at that point. The first viruses were found in um, tobacco mosaic disease, which is a disease of the tobacco plant where the leaves turn yellow and wilt and the plant dies. And it was found that whatever was infecting these plants was smaller than a bacteria. So that's where the word virus came from. It's the Latin word meaning poison. Uh, Betternick, the one who found this out, thought the viruses were liquid in nature. We know that that's not true now, but back in the 1890s, they didn't know any better. All right, some basics about viruses. What are they? Well, they're very, very small. Let's start with that. So this is the corner of a red blood cell. This is an E. coli bacillus shaped cell. And then viruses are much, much smaller than even that E. coli cell, okay? You can only see a virus with an electron microscope. You can't see them with a light microscope. Because viruses aren't living, they're not included in the tree of life. They're not living because they don't reproduce on their own, they don't metabolize things, they don't carry out the functions of life that a normal cell would. They have to be inside a very specific host cell to reproduce. So because they have to be in a specific host cell to reproduce, we call viruses obligate intracellular pa parasites or intracellular pathogens. So they must be inside a cell. Most all viruses destroy the cells that they replicate inside. And viruses can infect all different kinds of organisms, plants, animals, even bacteria. So there are lots of different cells that could be hosts to viruses. Most viruses are very, very specific about the type of host and the type of cell that they can infect even within that host. So some viruses, like I said, can infect bacterial cells. Those are called bacteriophages, or phages for short. Um, other viruses can be identified by their host group, like plant viruses or animal viruses. But viruses cause disease by replicating inside a cell and then killing the cells it's replicating in. They can also cause abnormal growth of a cell, cell death, obviously. Um, alteration of the cell's genome. So sometimes viral genome can be incorporated into the host genome. And some viruses actually don't produce a very noticeable effect in the cell. We'll get to that later. Viruses are transmitted by direct contact or indirect contact with things like fomites or through a vector like an animal or an insect that transmits um, a pathogen from one host to another. Some viruses can be transmitted to humans from animals, and those are called zoonotic diseases or zoonosis. All right, so here's the structure of a virus. The virus particle itself is called a virion. It's made of a nucleic acid. That nucleic acid can either be DNA or RNA. It can be single-stranded or double-stranded, but it can never be both. It will never be both DNA and RNA. It will never be both double or single stranded. It's either one or the other. Around the outside of that genetic information is a tightly packed protein coat, and that's called a capsid. The little subunits of the capsid are called capsomeres. Okay, so it's, um, it's genome inside a protein shell. Outside of that capsid, you may or may not have an envelope. Some viruses have envelopes and some don't. An envelope is essentially a phospholipid bilayer, just like the plasma membrane of a cell. Oftentimes it is derived from the cell membranes of the host that the virion replicated in. 
one of the most important structures on a virus is called spikes. So spikes, just as the name implies, they extend outward and away from the um, capsid or envelope. And at the tips are very specialized um, structures that allow it to attach to its specific host cells. So the viral spikes are very specific. They only attach to the exact kind of host cell that they're looking for. A lot of times these are made of glycoproteins. Okay. Here's another picture. So here is a virion. You have your genetic material, your capsid, and this one has an envelope on the outside of it. And then you have all of these spikes, right? And here's a host cell down here. And on the surface of the host cell are these blue kind of inverse triangle looking things. And those are called receptors. The spikes bind to the receptors very specifically. And then that allows the virus to be taken into the cell. All right, some basics of viral structure, um, some shapes of capsids. Capsids can have lots of different shapes. Some of them can be helical, cylindrical or rod shaped. Oh. Um, and here's a couple of examples. Here is Ebola virus. It's actually a helical virus. It's very long and kind of wraps around itself. That's one of the larger viruses. A lot of viruses that we'll see are polyhedral, like many sided, kind of like a soccer ball um, or less sides than that sometimes. Um, the number of sides and the shape of the sides vary widely across different species of viruses. There may or may not be an envelope outside of the capsid. So here's a virus without an envelope. Here's a virus with an envelope. You can see the envelope is on the outside and then inside that you have the capsid and then the nucleic acids in, inside of that. And then pretty much all of the other viral structures we call complex. Um, here is a great example of a bacteriophage. A bacteriophage has a really unique structure. It has this capsid on top um, and then this cylindrical piece called the sheath. And then on the end, it has what we call base plate pins and tails. And what these do is these on the bottom here attach to the host cell. And then once the bacteriophage is attached to the host cell, um, this kind of functions as like a syringe to inject the DNA into the host cell. All right, a little bit about viral classification and taxonomy. So they're not part of the tree of life, right? There's no domain kingdom phylum class, but we do give viruses some um, categories so that we can study them better, right? So there are seven orders. The orders are broken up into families. Family names end in viridae. So you might hear um, a virus group ending in viridae. That's a family of viruses. And then below that, we have families divided into genera or genuses, if you wanna be less proper. Um, genus names usually end in virus, like coronavirus, influenza virus, polio virus. And then further from genus is species, right? Some species are classified and some aren't. Um, sometimes it only goes down to the genus, but there are lots of different species within virus genera. Okay? And classification of virus is based a lot on genetics, um, especially this day and age. It's the easiest way to classify them. We see how similar their genomes are to other viruses. Or we do some biochemistry or things like that. Um, morphology, looking at the size, shape of the capsid, or how they multiply, or what they multiply in. One of the biggest classifications of viruses is what kind of host cells they infect. So some examples are either enveloped or non-enveloped viruses, right? We can classify them by their genome, single-stranded, double-stranded, RNA or DNA. RNA viruses can either be positive strand or negative strand RNA, and that has to do with the mechanisms of transcription and translation that have to happen once the genome enters a cell. We're not going to get into that, but you might hear something like a negative stranded, a negative single stranded RNA virus. Okay, so that's what that means. Um, the genomes may be segmented into different pieces, or it may just be one big piece. Like I said, host specificity is an important one capsid shape, and then whether there are any special enzymes or genes present in that virus or not. For example, retroviruses like HIV have a special enzyme that lets the, 
that enables the host cell to put the genome of the virus into the host genome. It's called reverse transcriptase. Here is a big table of different common viruses that you may come across um, and their kind of group. So what their genome looks like, double-stranded DNA enveloped. You have the herpes viruses and the pox viruses, double-stranded DNA, naked or non-enveloped. The adenoviruses, which cause lots of different colds, the papillomaviruses, which can cause um, warts and cancer. Uh, let's see, single-stranded RNA, naked viruses, um, like the picornaviruses, like rhinovirus is another one that can cause common cold. Negative single-strand RNA enveloped. You have um, Ebola virus down here. Okay, so there's lots of different examples. All right, our next focus is gonna be on the life cycle of viruses. So where does replication occur and what are the steps that it occurs in? In an animal or plant virus, the genome is inside the nucleus of the cell, right? So the viral replication has to occur inside the nucleus as well because that's where the machinery for replicating DNA is. If you are an RNA virus, then your replication machinery is in the cytoplasm, so that's where you're gonna replicate. And then bacteriophages, um, they replicate inside the cytoplasm of bacteria because bacteria, again, don't have a nucleus. All right, so let's talk about bacteriophage life cycles first because they're more complex. And then we'll talk about just general viral life cycles like for an animal virus. So bacteriophages have two possible life cycles. One is lytic and the other is lysogenic. In a lytic, life cycle phase. They are making copies of themselves and lysing the cell, killing the cell. In the lysogenic phase, the virus can integrate its genome into the host genome and establish a chronic or latent infection. So if we look at the lytic bacteriophage life cycle, it is broken out into five steps. Okay, the first step is attachment, where the phage attaches to the host surface. Okay, penetration where the genome enters the cell, biosynthesis, making more bacteriophages, maturation, assembling all of the pieces together, and then lysis, breaking out of the cell. All right, the lysogenic bacteriophage life cycle is a little bit different. So instead of killing the cell, the phage takes its genome and combines that with the bacterial host genome, and it just becomes part of the bacteria. At certain points, though, that genome can be excised from the bacterial genome and it can start making um, new, back, new viruses in um, a lytic cycle, so like reactivating it into a lytic cycle. All right, other things that can happen with bacteriophages, transduction. So when a phage is made uh, with a piece of the host genome on accident instead of a viral genome, so the bacteriophage housing, if you will, is actually taking a piece of other bacterial DNA instead of viral DNA and bringing that to a different cell. Um, this can actually um, give the host new pieces of genome and new, um, new functions, right, new genes. And then there's specialized transduction when a prophage is activated into the lytic cycle, so it's integrated into the genome and then it comes back out and sometimes it takes some of the host genome with it. So viral and host versus just um, host. All right, so let's talk about animal viruses. And this is unfortunately not as good of a picture as I thought it would be. Um, but there are six steps and we're gonna talk about each one. Attachment, penetration, encoding, biosynthesis, assembly, and release. It's so kind of similar to the um, lytic cycle of the bacteriophage. All right, the first step is attachment. Attachment happens from the spikes on the outside of the virus attaching to specific receptors on the host cell membranes, right? Different animal cells have different um, proteins and carbohydrates and things on their cell surface. So because of that, that is where the specificity comes from. The spikes are specific for very certain molecules on the host cell. Once that attachment happens, the virus has to enter the cell. It can enter in a couple of different ways. The first one is by penocytosis. So penocytosis 
happens when in eukaryotes, they just kind of make this little inlet of their plasma membrane, and then they kind of pinch that off and bring that into the cell as a vacuole. So sometimes when a virus binds to the spike, it can trigger this to happen in that location. And so the virus gets taken up into the cell um, in a vacuole. The other one is fusion. So for envelope viruses, they're covered in phospholipid bilayer, right? And the outside of our cells have phospholipid bilayer in the plasma membrane. So if you put two phospholipid bilayers together, they can kind of fuse and become one, kind of like um, if you're blowing bubbles and you have two bubbles that um, go together, they can sometimes pop and become one big bubble. Okay, same kind of thing. So if you're a virus and you're doing that, you have your envelope that actually fuses with the plasma cell membrane, or the plasma membrane of the host cell rather, um, and the viral particle just kind of gets kicked into the cell when that fusion happens. All right, the next step is uncoating. So once the virus particle gets inside the cell, the capsid has to come off before that nucleic acid can start being replicated. So that is called uncoating. There are enzymes inside the host cells or sometimes viruses carry their own enzymes that help this process happen. Step four is biosynthesis, making more pieces of virus, right? Making new, new genome and making new proteins to make the capsid and things like that, okay? The fifth step is assembly, putting those pieces together. The capsid protein specifically, they'll migrate and congregate near the cell membrane on the inside of the cell and they'll kind of assemble around a new viral genome and this creates virions and then those virions will either lice or bud out of the cell in step six called release so release if you're an envelope virus you are going to bud out of a cell there's a really great kind of step-by-step -step picture here where you have the capsid near the plasma membrane it starts pushing on the plasma membrane and takes a little bubble of plasma membrane with it on the way out so that's budding or if you are a non-envelope virus you will rupture the cell and kill it and a whole bunch of virions will come spilling out. A unique kind of virus are the retroviruses like HIV. So they are a positive sensed single stranded RNA virus. They have a special enzyme called reverse transcriptase inside the capsid because that reverse transcriptase has to take the RNA and reverse transcribe it into DNA because normal transcription is DNA to RNA, right? So this is reverse. And then once it's DNA, that DNA can get integrated into the host genome. And that can stay there for a long, long period of time and give us a latent infection. So here's a picture of that in the HIV life cycle. A couple of other things. Plant viruses are mostly positive strand or positive single strand RNA viruses. They follow a similar path to animal viruses. Um, they have either a narrow or a broad host range, which remember um, plant cells are just as diverse as animal cells. Okay? Plant viruses are transmitted by contact, sometimes by fungi or nematodes or other insects. Um, and a lot of them will establish infection without killing the host. Then we have our persistent viral infections. So when a viral infection is not completely cleared from a host, it can stay in certain cells or tissues for long periods of time. It can be silent or it can go um, undergo a productive infection without killing the host. Then you get latent or chronic viral infections. Um, so a great example of latent viral infection is chickenpox. Okay? The chickenpox virus is in the herpes virus family. It establishes infection in the cells, and then you know the chickenpox disease goes away, but the virus isn't completely eliminated. And later in life, or after a very stressful event, that virus can reemerge as shingles, um, which is why a lot of elderly people are encouraged to get shingles shots. Um, it's kind of like a more severe, more targeted at neuron disease than chickenpox is. <laughs> 
um, or you can get chronic diseases where you have a low level of symptoms over a long time where people just can't eliminate the virus, HIV, if it comes out of latency, hepatitis, viruses, things like that. All right, let's talk about the phases of viral infection. So first you have inoculation where the virus gets into the cells. And then once the virus is in the cells, it's undetectable for a brief period of time. That's called the eclipse period. It's undetectable because during that period, the virus is inside those initial host cells making more copies and they haven't come out yet. Um, and once those copies start coming out and cells start lysing and things like that, then you have your viral burst, your big kind of infection um, where you have a lot of symptoms present, a lot of cells are dying, a lot of virions are present in the host. Working with viruses in the lab is really interesting and you definitely can do it. The only caveat is that you have to grow the host cells first and then infect those host cells with virus and then the virus will replicate in those host cells um, and then lyse those host cells on the way out. And then you can harvest that virus from the media that the cells were growing in. If you wanna work with bacteriophages on bacteria, first you would grow a layer of bacteria on a plate and then infect that with virus in that what will happen is you'll get these little kind of inverse colonies they're called plaques little areas where the bacteria have died by lysis because of the virus so the virus is present where these dots are all right a little bit about other acellular pathogens viruses are obviously the biggest one we have a couple derivatives of viruses we have virioids and virusoids Virioids are short strands of circular RNA that are capable of self-replication without a capsid. Some plant diseases are um, made of virioids. And again, they control host machinery to replicate their genome just like a virus does. And virusoids, virusoids are um, responsible for some plant diseases. They have to be inside a host cell that's also infected with a second virus. So they kind of jump onto that second virus's replication. The other category of acellular pathogens are prions. Prions are really interesting in that they're actually proteins. They're the misfolded form of a normal protein that causes other proteins in the cell to misfold and clump together, um, causing cell death. So a lot of times this is found in the brain. Some diseases it's responsible for are sheep scrapie. Uh, mad cow disease, Creutzfeldt Jacobs disease, um, Kuru, there's a few others that I can't think of off the top of my head. But it's transmissible in that it can be spread from one host to another, usually by um, consuming the tissue. So in mad cow disease, um, a lot of cattle were slaughtered, and I think the 90s, because there was a big outbreak of mad cow disease in Europe. So it's transmissible in the fact that it can be transmitted from one host to another, usually by consuming infected tissue. So whether that's meat or brain or whatever have you, um, it causes things like brain damage, loss of motor coordination, dementia, and death, because you're literally just killing the brain cells, right? Um, transmission can occur either by consumption or by contact of tissue or fluid. Uh, prion diseases progress very rapidly and there is no cure for them. So here are um, some pictures of a prion disease in the brain. Okay, so on the left we have disease tissue and on the right we have normal. So in normal tissue, you can see that everything is pretty well spread out. You know, the brain itself is um, more white and light gray, right? But in the disease tissue, you have all of these holes in the tissue. Right, and those holes have been derived from cells that have died. And when you look at that on the larger scale in the brain itself, you see all of these um, kind of darker gray areas where it's actually darker because there are just holes there, there are pores, if you will. Um, so it's really spongy brain tissue, which is where the term spongiform encephalopathic comes from. All right, here are some great review tables or inf informational tables for you rather um, of different kinds of viruses that are clinically relevant um, and a little bit about them 
And here are a couple of really great review videos on viruses. Um, there is an Amoeba Sisters one, a Bozeman Science one, um, and I will link these in our um, lecture module on Canvas. A couple of um, other viruses I just want to tell you about. So we have tobacco mosaic virus. It was the first virus ever discovered. It turns out that it only infects plants. It's found throughout the United States um, and other parts of the world likely as well. Um, the infection causes this characteristic modding and discoloration on the leaves of the plants. And the plants are essentially useless um, as a cash crop. And the virus itself can stay in the soil. So if, um, if the soil has been contaminated with virus, you have to not grow anything in that soil for at least two years um, for the virus to go away. West Nile virus didn't used to be a problem where we are. It started out in the tropics and it's spread throughout and it's now a common thing even up here in New Hampshire. It can infect uh, birds primarily, but also humans, horses, dogs, cats, bats, um, lots of other things. It's transmitted through the mosquito. The good news is that approximately 90% of infections are asymptomatic or they can cause mild fever or in very severe cases it can cause West Nile meningitis or encephalitis and this is the most deadly and thankfully the most rare form of disease caused by the virus. The incubation period for West Nile is two to eight days. There is no vaccine available. The really only way to avoid getting it is to avoid getting bitten. So um, using bug sprays and things like that. Hantavirus, this is one you might not have heard of before, but it's actually um, worldwide, including where we are. It's spread through um, different kinds of mice. So the deer mouse, the white-footed mouse, the rice rat, the cotton rat. It can cause a pulmonary syndrome and get transmitted to humans, uh, <clears throat> causing fever, muscle aches, fatigue, uh, but then very rapidly progressing to um, breathing difficulty and vomiting and things like that. Interestingly enough, it's caused from breathing in the virus from either dried up rodent urine or droppings that have been like stirred up in, in, into the air. Um, that's one of the reasons you have to be really careful if you find mouse droppings somewhere. Um, the best way to prevent the spread of the disease and to prevent the disease in general is by keeping mice out of your home. And if you have to clean up mouse droppings, to clean them up with bleach and water. And then we have Ebola virus. Ebola virus is endemic to um, the Ebola River region in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It's a very fatal disease in both humans and in non-human primates. So um, chimpanzees, monkeys, that kind of thing. It's spread through contact um, with body fluid. The incubation period for Ebola can be anywhere from two days to 21 days. The onset is very abrupt, characterized by fever, headache, joint and muscle aches, weakness, and it progresses to diarrhea, vomiting, um, and then hemorrhaging. It is... <laughs> For the most part, it stays in the regions that it is endemic to in Africa, but we know now because of human travel that it has the potential to be, um, we know now that because of human travel, it has the potential to travel worldwide. Another one that's relevant for us is rabies virus. Okay, rabies virus um, is transmitted rabies virus transmission occurs through the saliva of infected animals so for humans if you get rabies it's almost always fatal but the incubation period is months so that's why if you get bitten by a rabid animal they give you the rabies vaccines because those will take hold in your immune system before the virus comes out of the incubation period but if not um, it's very, very severe and very fast moving. Um, headache, fever, acute pain into violent movements, uncontrolled excitement, depression, and hydrophobia, and then mania, lethargy, and coma, um, and death by encephalitis. So very much not, um, not a good way to go. So 
the virus infects the salivary glands of canines primarily, um, and it makes the canines salivate more, hence like the foamy spit that you see, um, and that spit is full of viruses because it comes out in the saliva. And of course we have to talk about coronaviruses. So coronaviruses are a family of viruses. They're a very large family that only rarely infect humans and they even more rarely spread from human to human. So what we're dealing with right now is a very rare um, species of coronaviruses. They're spherical enveloped viruses with large single-stranded RNA genomes, okay? They usually cause acute, mild upper respiratory infections. Um, and they're transmitted by airborne droplets. Those airborne droplets now we know can land on surfaces and be transmitted that way. Coronaviruses are transmitted by airborne droplets. They generally replicate in the upper airway epithelial cells. Um, however, we know that the coronavirus that's spreading right now, it replicates inside um, the bronchii and can cause a lot of lung issues, including pneumonia. Uh, certain strains may be more virulent, like the one we're dealing with right now, uh, particularly ones that spread easily through humans, um, case in point. Um, another recent coronavirus that we had to deal with was SARS. SARS was mostly an outbreak in Asia, um, but did travel worldwide, but it didn't affect us here in the United States nearly as bad um, as the COVID-19 pandemic that we're dealing with now. So a little bit about COVID-19 specifically. Um, it is a beta coronavirus, similar to SARS coronavirus. Um, we think that it originated in bats, although there are people from the World Health Organization and others that are working on actually tracking that now. Um, so it'll be interesting to see when that information comes out. It was first detected in humans in Wuhan city in Hubei province in China. A lot of early patients had a link to a large seafood and live animal market in China. So coronavirus was spread from Wuhan out, we think, by human travel. Um, there are a lot of things out there in the news right now about, oh, was coronavirus found in other places of the world earlier? We, we don't really know. Um, it's hard to know exactly where it started, but it's spread by human travel, right? The virus is not living, right? It doesn't travel by itself. It spreads because of human movement. Um, what we do know is that the genomes of viruses that are isolated from patients around the world are very similar, suggesting one single emergence from an animal reservoir that has spread rapidly. There are a few very subtle strain differences among different viruses of coronavirus. Um, there are some things out there in the news now that there are different strains that are a little bit more virulent or more easily able to infect, um, but we don't really know a lot about that yet. We, what we do know is that the range of illnesses we're seeing is from very mild, including asymptomatic, mm -hmm. up to severe, including death, right? And we don't completely understand it, although the longer we're dealing with this, the more we're learning about it. Um, and it's caused more than 500,000 deaths worldwide. Um, and it's just, gonna, it's, it's still going. All right, here is a snapshot that I took the other day from Johns Hopkins University of Medicine. This looks a little different than the slides that you have because I wanted to update this. Um, this is as of June 30th, 2020 at 11.55 in the morning. So numbers of total confirmed cases, 10,350,645. Global deaths, 506,000. So, and the, all of the red areas on the map show you where um, in the world it has been found and documented. It's probably more prevalent than that, it just hasn't been documented. Um, but this is no, by no means going away yet. Um, the good news is there are a lot of vaccines in progress that, that could be beneficial. We won't know until those vaccines are tested and they're being tested this summer. So there are places in the United States where we're seeing a lot more virus all of a sudden because some of the places in the country have started to open up um, and it really wasn't time yet and there are still a lot of virus out there. And people in general in our society are getting tired of dealing with this virus. Um, but the thing about nature is that nature doesn't care if you're tired of it or not. It's still going to keep going. Um, and so until we get a good vaccine and that vaccine is distributed widely to our population um, and most people are vaccinated, we're not going to see this go away.
So it really, I think at this point, it really revolves around a vaccine. So there's a lot out there to learn. There's a lot to be learned. We still don't know a lot about coronavirus or COVID-19, um, but what I would say is to keep up on the news, um, make sure you're looking at credible sources for information and um, really use your best scientific judgment um, and your medical backgrounds to make the best decisions for yourself and your families. And that's the end.